Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Boston Public Library, welcome to the Central Library and the inaugural program for this year's Lowell Lecture Series, Gateway to Learning. We're delighted that you could join us. I'm Beth Prindle, Manager of Exhibitions and Programming, and we at the Boston Public Library would like to express our deepest appreciation to the Lowell Institute for their generous and continued sponsorship of this series. Since its inception in 1836, the Lowell Institute has been supporting speaker series in many institutions with the mission to make great ideas accessible to all people free of charge. I can't imagine a better place for the series to take place than here at the BPL, where free to all is inscribed over our doors. The library would also like to thank the Boston Public Library Foundation, which provides funding for programs such as this for all ages, expanded resources for the library system, and restored and improved spaces all in the name of advancement of learning. Visit the Foundation's table outside if you haven't done so, if you'd like to learn more about their work and how you can support the BPL. So this year's series, Gateway to Reading, will explore the fundamental importance of childhood literacy and address the joys, discoveries, questions, and challenges facing today's generations of young readers. The series is particularly timely for the BPL as a major renovation of the Central Library in Copley Square is underway. The library pioneered the first dedicated children's room in the nation right here, and this renovation provides an opportunity to build on that legacy and make some new history. So before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to share a few housekeeping details. If you could please silence your cell phones and anything that might go beep. Regarding this evening's structure, our speaker will speak uh, for about 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. All lectures are videotaped and available on the library's website. And then finally, please be sure, if you haven't done so, to pick up a copy of the Lowell Lecture brochure um, on the way out, which lists information on the entire series. So now to tonight's speaker. Nineveh Caligari has dedicated her life to creating supportive and innovative learning environments for both teachers and students, and to raising awareness of the unheralded struggles that many teachers face in simply doing their job. This is a moment to put in a personal um, thanks to her as I was a former teacher before coming here to the library, so this means a great deal. She holds a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and she spent her first year in classroom at Cambridge Ringe in Latin. Subsequently, she spent 10 years as a teacher in, in, at Drake High School in San Anselmo and at San Francisco's first charter school, Leadership High School. With McSweeney's founder, Dave Eggers, she started 826 Valencia, a student writing program that has spawned 826 National, as, many as, as well as many other local 826 chapters, including our own 826 Boston. Staff, students, and volunteers from 826 Boston are in attendance tonight, and please visit their table outside in the hall following the lecture to learn more about this wonderful program. Ms. Caligari is the president of the Teacher Salary Project, the co-author of Teachers Have It Easy, and the co-producer of American Teacher, a documentary by Oscar-winning director Vanessa Roth, with narration by Matt Damon. We welcome her to our snowy Boston from her home in San Francisco, where she lives there with her husband and two young children. It gives me great pleasure tonight to welcome Nineveh Caligari. You all will move closer. Am I, am I on? I am on. Can you hear me? Some of you feel so far away. Should we come in closer? Or are people very happy with where they're seated? Very happy. Okay, that's great. I am really incredibly happy to be here myself, and I just want to introduce that these three women here are three of my favorite and most influential mentors of my entire life. So my career did start here, and I was sad to leave uh, because of last and first out. Actually, I lost my job at Cambridge Ringe and Latin, and I went home, but I thought I was going to live here forever. So I was really incredibly happy to live here, and I'm really honored to be back. I am going to give everybody the agenda for tonight, which is, I don't know if you're videotaping me, maybe I'm standing in the wrong spot. Tonight, um, we're going to have an incredibly good time. We are, I'm going to get to know all of you a little bit. I'm going to tell you about the two main projects I've worked on. I have a really spectacular surprise to share with you. I have a little homework to give you, and then I also have, of course, presents for any educators in the audience. So that's our agenda. With that, I will start by saying that um, maybe you agree with me uh, because you're here, and I believe we're probably all here because we care about children and we care about our country. And um, I think our country's greatest asset are the kids that went to school today and their teachers. 
And I think our country's greatest challenge is to put teachers in conditions so that they can do their best work and so the students can maximize their learning. So what we're going to do is go around and individually, I would love to learn your name and what you think our country's greatest asset and challenge are. Actually, on, on second thought, I, I think given the amount of time that we have, since I only have 40 minutes, we'll just do it all at once. So if you guys, on the count of three, if you can tell me your name, what you think our country's greatest asset is, and what our country's greatest challenge. Do you need a moment? Okay, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> No one else? No one else has an asset or challenge? You liked yours. You liked mine? You agreed with mine? Sometimes people say freedom of speech, democracy, no other assets or challenges. Okay, well, I'm just, I'm glad that we all agree. I'm glad to know that because then you will definitely like my, like my comments. I'm going to take you back to uh, 2002 when I started 826 with, um, as Beth mentioned, with Dave Eggers. And I was really compelled to do the work because when I had 146 students, there was it was impossible to give them the amount of attention that I thought that they needed. And I would often assign their writing assignments and then map out how many weekends it would take me to read their assignments. So I knew that there was a huge gap between how much time teachers had and how much time they wished they could give their students. And so when Dave, I was teaching in Mexico, and Dave, who's my friend, called me and said, I've leased this space. I think I need your help. And I said, great. That sounds perfect. I would, love to, I would love to work with you and focus on this huge gap that teachers have and support them. And then uh, he said to me, well, it turns out that the space has uh, a zoning requirement, and we're going to need to put in a store in Innovay. And I said, great. That sounds good. And then he said, I'm thinking pirates. And I said, great. And I was thinking, you're crazy. So I just thought, well, that's, you'll focus on your pirate store, and I'll focus on the families and the teachers and the students, and we'll sort of divide and conquer. And then... It's true, we do actually have a pirate store, and I am completely sold now. It sucks people in. Students can open trap doors on the floor. They can find snakes and treasures. Mops literally fall from the ceiling. They can find treasures inside also that huge vat. And since a lot of kids don't carry cash, they can barter for their treasure so they can tell a joke, they can tell a story, write a poem, and they can keep their treasure. So the... the store is incredibly, incredibly hilarious and interactive, and students can admire the fish tank, and they have favorite fish, and they can feed the fish, and all of this leads back, of course, into the heart of what we're doing, which is essentially tutoring students. So starting in 2002, there are four main academic activities that we started, and those four main activities have stayed constant through all all these years and also through all the different chapters around the country, as Beth mentioned, we opened a bunch of different ones. And so we tutor students after school. This is what you see here. And of course, just hoping that the students not only complete their homework but understand it, go home and enjoy their families. In the morning, students come in and will meet an author, revise an es essay, or sometimes even leave as published authors with a book that looks like this. In the evenings, group of students, oh, my favorite part about this book is that um, there's an about the author section, so the students have their portrait, and they can write a bio about themselves, and then they can write their own blurb, best book ever, Amy Tan, or whatever they want to write. Um, in the evening, students come for workshops, and they uh, will do a whole range of things, ranging from very serious college entrance essay work to writing stories for your pet, and teachers will bring in animals, and the students have to read in an engaging manner and see if they can hold their dog's attention. <laughs> or they'll, they also write, there's a class that I like called This Class Sucks, which is critique. And so the, the tutors have invented, these writers have invented a million different topics for the students to dive in and share their passion with writing. So I think um, it's exciting for the volunteers to be a part of 826 also because they get to engage in the creative process. So we always, from the beginning, I would say when people would come in, I'm like, I can put anybody to work. You know, there's a job for everybody. And then volunteers would invent events, like I said, invent workshops, help students with their essays. They would, well, Daniel, well, Daniel will tell us more in a minute, but we, um, we just invite the, the volunteers to be a part of 
every aspect of 826, and so they, they get to do a huge amount of things, including making films and newspapers and videos. And so I have a very short, um, I have a very short example of some things that the Michigan volunteers made uh, so that you can see what I mean, and hopefully this will play. We will, I'll cross my fingers that Joe made it work. Are you ready to go to the 826 and volunteer? Sure am, but I forgot to ask, how much does this thing pay? It does not pay. We are volunteering to tutor young humans in writing. Excellent. I love creative writing, but they will have to mail all of my checks directly to my home. I do not do direct we, deposit. No, we do not receive pay of any kind. There yeah. is no pay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Under the table. I get it. Tax issues. I'm sorry. I must be confusing you. We are doing this to help young people write. And for the Benjamins. Hey, what are you going to buy with all the money we make at A26? Nothing. I'm not going to buy any money, anything with money, because there's no money involved. Yeah. I'm going to save mine, too. When I, uh, when I was teaching, and even with a hundred, this is, how many people have been in the classroom, including my three mentors? It's probably about half. We, um, I don't know if you experienced this, hopefully you didn't, but when I, even when I had 146 students, I sometimes found teaching lonesome. And um, so I worried about the volunteers having sometimes hard days with students. And so I worked really hard to create something called a volunteer happiness program where volunteers would gather for spelling bees, chili cook-offs, singles parties, thumb wrestling tournaments, anything on earth to build community. Because what I worried is that a volunteer would go into a school and a child might have their, their head slumped over and not feel like writing about whether the Progressive Era was a success or not that day, and the volunteer would take it personally. And so my hope was that they would run into another volunteer in the hallway, and they would say, man, I'm no good at tutoring. And the other volunteer would say, no, you're good. You have to come back. You have to give that child another chance. Don't give up. And so we worked really hard to create this complete, wonderful interconnectivity between the adults who work at our, at our centers. And the other aspect that happened with the volunteers is that also when I had 146 students, I sometimes forgot that learning was joyful. I don't know if that has ever happened to any of the teachers that you're so bogged down with an incredible amount of work to do and committee meetings and a thousand different responsibilities on campus that I forgot that actually working hard in the act of learning something was really a, an act, a joyful act. And so the volunteers really taught me that we could have an incredibly good time and work hard at the same time. I'm going to take another sip of water. I, um, I want to say, though, out of the different academic programs, my absolute favorite is when we send teams of volunteers into the schools to help teachers where they are with these big, magnificent projects that they invent. I think one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons I honestly in my heart believe that H6 has been as successful as it is is because we work at the teacher's behest. I'd like to tell people that we make teacher's dreams come true. So it's the teacher's curriculum, it's her ideas, it's her vision for a literary magazine or a book about this or a book about that or any, any kind of support that, that they're looking for, we try and bring in the humans and the resources. And I learned, having worked in schools, we don't ask the principal for any money. So we've gotten away with all of this, um, all of this incredible support that we've given teachers. So um, with that, so that's the basics of the program. I usually speak too quickly. My students would say, Ms. Clements, Ms. Clements, you're going too fast. Am I going too fast? Everybody? Everybody's up to speed? All right. So those are the four basic programs that we started in San Francisco in that first year, including going into the classroom and including uh, these professional publications, which I'll tell you about in a second. But, so we opened in 2004 in Brooklyn, and this is a superhero supply store where you can buy things like the speed of light, which is really necessary for superheroes. And um, also you can buy capes, but in order to make sure that your cape fits you well, there is a, uh, there's a cape testing area where you can put on your cape and then make sure that it works well for your body and for you know, the speed that you're hoping to access. And that's actually my daughter a couple years ago. That's the sixth. We, if we have time for questions, you can ask me about this or my topic, but she's the sixth Nineveh in my family. Uh, at the Greenwood Space Travel Supply Store in Seattle, this is a place uh, where if you show up on a rocket, you can park your rocket on the roof and then refuel and then head off on your way. And this is the Boring Store. It's uh, 
I don't normally like to tell people, so if you guys promise to not tell anybody, I'll just let you know that it's actually a spy store. But of course, we don't want spies to lose their cover. So it's a boring store. And then these are the interiors, and the interior tutoring spaces in, in all A26s are just glamorous and gorgeous and don't feel at all like hospitals and uh, I think are incredibly welcoming. And this is completely different design from the other ones, and I think it's really beautiful. The Echo Time Travel Mart, this is in L.A., and uh, what I love the tagline. Oh, here, actually, if you're a young person, you can go in and you can get a passport, and you can put yourself in any time in the history of humans or, or before. And um, the tagline, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, whenever you are, we're already then, which I've always really loved. And then, of course, we opened in Ann Arbor, and we also opened in D.C., but thanks to, we have two of H6 founders here, so hopefully you'll get a chance to connect with them. But um, thanks to Helen and Daniel, we have the, the Greater Bigfoot Research Institute. So those are all the chapters. And what, our, um, what all the chapters share in common, like I mentioned a second ago, was professional quality publishing. So we make students, and we started doing this our very first year, we asked students to write 8 to 12 drafts of an essay. And that's not normally what they would write for an English paper. And I always, when I train teachers, I would always tell them, there's going to be a moment with this project where you feel like, has anyone done any high altitude hiking? Only three of us, four, oh, now, okay, people are confessing slowly. Um, there was a moment when I was hiking at about 18,000 feet and I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I... I couldn't, I mean, it was hard to walk, and I felt that I, that must be what it must feel like to be 120. And I tell teachers, there's going to be a moment where you feel like you can't breathe. No one likes the project anymore. No one wants to continue. And somehow, every single time, isn't that true? Every single time, these awesome students push through that last final part of this humongous process, they... They meet editors, designers. We welcome them into the editorial part of the process. They make executive decisions about these books. And they really get an apprenticeship-like experience. And here, here you see we have the student books sitting alongside professional, uh, professional books. And we sell the books all over the country. And I think that we have amazing, amazing results. I always... Um, I always love to imagine, we try and put the books in independent bookstores, and I love to imagine a teenager running down the street and seeing a bookstore and running with a friend and then grabbing the friend and saying, well, let's go in and let's see if my book is there, and then finding their book on the bookshelf and just showing their friend their name and a table of contents and what that would mean. And then, of course, teenagers, $16 is a lot of money, so then I imagine the child probably puts the book back and then runs off, but, but leaves really incredibly elated. So we... Um, you know, I, I think it's really important. We don't cherry-pick children. I think this is another one of the magic sauces of 826. We don't grab the 10 kids who already see themselves as very serious novelists in high school. We all know who, the, who they are. We actually grab everybody. And um, one of my favorite transformations is when you introduce... This would, I can, I'll give you a specific example. I introduced um, a book about family histories to a group of sophomores at Balboa High School in San Francisco. And the kids are sort of slumped in their chair. And I'm, and I'm there enthusiastically telling them that they're all going to become authors. And they're like, all right, lady, you know. And I said, you're all going to become authors. And that didn't get very much of a response um, and not a ton of eye contact. And then I said, and Amy Tan is going to write the introduction. And that got no response because they hadn't read Joy Luck Club yet. They didn't know who she was. And so you go from that image to... Six months later, where the students come to a beautiful building, a setting like this, and they're floating, they're walking 10 feet tall, and their shirts are starched, and they've brought their girlfriend and their mother and their auntie, and watching that transformation between the child who was completely not interested in what we were saying into a published author is really, um, is really remarkable. Um, and I think you would agree, right? Um, I think... Uh, this is the second book that we published in San Francisco, and students wrote, Isabel Allende gave us money and asked us to uh, write about peace and conflict, and the students wrote about conflict in their daily lives, gang violence, peace in the Middle East. This book uh, we published in 2008. It's a series of letters to President Obama, and the book is called Thanks, and Have Fun Running the Country. 
So, from Boston, Damariel writes, Dear Barack Obama, I have a great idea for you. You should set up a special phone just for kids to call the president if they find things that are dangerous and can affect people, like someone smoking. This would be special, a special place for kids to talk to Barack Obama and let him know what's going on. I want to tell you, Barack Obama, if one day I could travel around the world and help people, I would definitely do it. And then Chad from Los Angeles writes, Dear President Obama, could you help my family get house cleaning jobs? I hope you will be a great president. If I were president, I would help all nations, even Hawaii. <laughs> Here, uh, we submitted the student essays to the New York Times, and we asked them to draw portraits of Obama. And I think it was between Paul Krugman and Friedman, and here you can see clearly that those are the images that the students have drawn of his face, so that was incredibly exciting. Um, the last student anthology that I edited was called Be Honest, and in this book, students wrote about what they wish their teachers knew. They wrote beautiful, beautiful, detailed, rich love letters to their teachers about everything that had gone well. They also wrote about things that they wish would happen if they were running schools, and this actually, I think, is heartbreaking, but they were just like, man, if I ran this school, I'd have clean bathrooms, I'd have working water fountains, I'd have more innovative use of space, and a rethinking of metal detectors, which of course just gives me any, I think every adult should pause there. Um, the books aren't really as important, though, as the skills that kids gain, obviously. When I was doing this work, we would ask, we would ask students before they started if they enjoyed writing and if they imagined using writing in their future, and always less than 10% said they liked it, and less than 10% were like, no, man, I, I mean, like, there's no way. I'm not, you know, over 90% would say there's no way I'm going to use writing in my future. Of course, they don't know that we all need to use writing in our, in our professional lives, but they don't, you don't know that when you're 15. So no, over 90% would shy away. When we would finish the book, we would then ask them again, do you enjoy writing, and do you think you'll use this in your professional future? And the answers are always over 50 and 60%. So literally five to six times as many kids will say, oh, you know what, actually, that was, that was rough, but there was something fulfilling about it. I could do that again, you know, or I could imagine using writing. And of course, then, by then, they've met all these people who are passionate about writing, and they've seen all these different adults who have all these different jobs who use writing and who think writing is a positive part of their lives. So the transformation is pretty awesome, I think. Um, speaking, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag about Boston. In September of 2013, a third-party evaluator published its findings on the effectiveness of 826 Boston's Young Authors Book Project. The evaluated project was conducted with 54 English language learners at Boston International High School. According to the study's authors, quote, a constellation of positive outcomes were displayed by students, greater enjoyment and persistence in the process of writing, increased confidence in the ability to write, belief in their own, belief, excuse me, that their own writing has value and ultimately improvement in the quality of their written work. Then the evaluator said 96% of students believe that they can use what they learned dur during the Young Author Book Project with other writing assignments. And as a challenge to these projects, the evaluators pointed out that working with 100% ELL presented unique challenges since it was often harder for students to convey the message they wanted to express in English, which could be their second, third, or fourth language, which I find incredibly moving. And then I read this, I, I gave a, a talk on Tuesday in San Diego, and I cried when I read this, so I don't think I'm going to cry tonight. I'm going to see if I make it through, but one never knows, so you have been warned. Meanwhile, the students wrote about their own process, the intro of the book, quote, At the beginning, we were a little afraid to start writing this book. Language is a struggle for us. Boston International Newcomers Academy is a 100% English language learner. Also, bringing back memories of loss and transition was at times devastating. But it was worth it. We had the courage to write our stories, and we were proud of them. So I cried. <laughs> um, so I, I am wondering whether you all are, each and every one of you, are ready for our humongous surprise. Do you feel ready? Does it seem like it's the right time? So I want you all to pretend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count to three again. I'm sorry for those that weren't expecting a very interactive evening. So anyway, bear with me. Um, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to pretend that you have just won a million dollars. Okay? One, two, three. Woo! These people are not happy that they've won a million dollars. We're going to have to try that again, because there's a reason that I'm doing this. How would you respond 
if you, if I had a million dollars and I handed it to you tax-free, how can I, how can I sweeten the deal? Okay, okay, maybe I'm moving, maybe it's because I'm moving too quickly, so we're just going to try this again. So, I'm going to hand you a million dollars when I count to three, and you could do anything you want with it. Okay? So let's see how this goes. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> it's like my family team down here screaming the loudest to try and make my experiment work. Okay. With that said, I have something better than that. You don't need a million dollars because I have something better than that. I have to introduce an incredibly, incredibly special guest. I have, there's an author here in our midst. Uh, her name is Nareda Pontes. She speaks three languages. She's a musician, and she's here from Cape Verde in our country, and she is now what makes us so proud to be American. And so if you could help me by screaming even louder than the million dollars and welcome our student author tonight, that would be really helpful. interesting. Her essay is not there. Do you, oh, you do. So this is Beth. She's the coordinator of the event. And she loved the essay so much that she grabbed it. This is an unusual turn of events for a Lowell series. Normally, Lowell series events are... Sorry about that. It's okay. It was not planned. Every Saturday, Sunday, and on vacation days, my mom and I will wake up early, get our banana, and start walking along the dark of the morning when the star was still out. And only farmers and bakers were awake. We lived in Cape Fred Fogo. A lot of different vans and yellow taxis carrying people to the city would pass by at high speed, almost hitting people on the sidewalks. I used to ask my mom why they wouldn't give us a ride. If they give us a ride, we will have to pay, she would say. And at the end of the day, we will not have enough money. Later in the morning, everyone will be awake. It made me think of a race because there were students rushing to school and adults rushing to work. In front of their houses, grandfathers and grandmothers were talking just like they were on the bench watching the race. We carried our clothes to sell in our bañera. We would go and show them all of the different garments we were selling. Customers would want to buy them because they had brand names. On the journey, we saw many vendors with their bañera. Some used them as fish containers, and some used them as bread containers in many different colors. My mom would tell me, never get tired of what you're doing because people see you selling clothes. I enjoyed walking along, meeting new neighborhoods, and getting to know new, new places. Sometimes we would go to places where a customer would welcome us. I would like to buy some of what you have, they would say, but it's too much for us. Then I will lower the price for you, my mom would reply. You can take the clothes and pay little by little. When my mom is negotiating, she is nice, although she gets mad quick. <laughs> Not everyone liked to see us on their way. There was a family who we used to see on their land speaking beans. Don't you guys feel, don't you guys have better things to do than bother people? They will say. You see us working hard here because we don't have money and you don't find it ridiculous to try to sell close to us. There are many shady trees by the mountains and some of them were covered by fruits. When we walked by, we would like to get some but we never did because we knew the landowners would go after us. We could hear the cars bipping, chicken frying, and the cows mooing. The smell of the coffee and bread that people were pre preparing as we reached their house made me want to go up 
and ask for some. My first impression of the bañera was that I hated it. It's not something a 10 years old would like. I thought it would ruin my life because all the other kids would see me selling clothes. And I detested that idea so much. But now I see that the bañera shows that I'm a hard working woman. And if one day I get a family, I can work to support it. Thank you. I just imagine myself moving to another country to uh, create a better life and future and um, trying to write a story in Creole or in Portuguese and then getting up at the Boston Public Library and sharing that story all about my personal life and I just don't know if I would have the courage. So thank you so much. I, um, I want to let everybody know that 826 Boston actually has a pretty special story because one of our original students at 826 Valencia came out to um, come to Harvard and as a college student he said, I want to I start it here. And I said, well, Kevin, I'll, you know, I'll support. that's a good idea, go ahead. And he started, and all of a sudden he would call me on his cell phone and he would say, I'm at, so -and -so, I'm at the superintendent's office, I'm at the some, some place. And I was like, okay, he's, he's serious. And once I realized he was serious, I said, okay, well, now you're going to call my old boss, Helen Jacobson. And she was at the time the principal at English High School, and he sent a very eloquent email to Helen saying, you know, I'm an innovative student from San Francisco. She suggested I connect with you. I'm very serious about starting a literacy center. And that was it. And she said, great. And she told a story of walking out into, into the foyer of her office and looking around and just seeing, you know, a child there and being like, where's Kevin? And of course, the child is like, hello, you know, I'm just age 19. Um, but they founded 826 together. And then we were so lucky to find everything relies so heavily on the executive director. So we were so lucky to find a poet and a teacher who's been leading it ever since to incredible success. So I would, I'll invite you again at the end of the night. It is, I'll secretly tell you now, it's one of your homework assignments to please join 826 in one way or another. Um, so we'll invite you again, but I really encourage you to become a shopper in the store, to become a donor, to obviously become a volunteer. Um, Daniel will find something wonderful for you to do, and I'm sure you'll find that work fulfilling. Um, what I want to say, then I'm going to conclude the 826 part, and then we will go quickly through the second part of my work, is that um, the final lessons that I feel like I learned um, and that we were trying to focus on along the way are, are these final sort of uh, philosophical core values. And one of the main things that I think 826 did a good job of is making sure young people knew that writing isn't magic and thunderbolts and lightning or something that happens automatically. And so we have these style manuscripts on all the walls and all the different centers so that young people will look and see that people who write for a living actually scribble out, cross off, get feedback, um, and have to, have to write drafts and drafts and drafts. And then the other, the other things that I think are really wonderful is everybody needing undivided attention. I love, like I said earlier, that I learned that we could actually have a really fun time and work hard at the same time. And I really believe, and I always believed, even before starting H26, that adults should do, I mean, I'm sorry, young people should do work that mimics adults' work and that they should have real audiences like we provided tonight. And I think that um, beautiful spaces are important. I think volunteering is really exciting. And I really think that we should all be focusing on helping teachers' dreams come true. Which leads me to the second nonprofit that I founded, which is... Um, which is called the Teacher Salary Project. And when I was teaching here in Cambridge, literally half the faculty of the pilot school had PhDs. The other half were teaching at Harvard also. It was the most dynamic place. And Joan was tutoring me every week and teaching for understanding. And I, was my brain, I could feel my brain exploding. And then I went to go work in Marin, and there I was running the American Studies Department. We got a huge grant from Autodesk, and we were flying people in from Harvard's Project Zero. And I presented at age 26 at my first national conference, and we were doing so many exciting things. And I was there, and I was watching the students grow. I had incredibly satisfying experience when I would have a student in world history and then in U.S. history. And when you have a student for two years in a row, and you see the magnificent growth in their brain and the impact that you 
you've had. It was so fulfilling. And I remember walking down the halls in the, in the corridors in Marin and thinking, no one's happier. Maybe some artists or maybe some doctors are as fulfilled. If you're actually healing people, that sounds pretty fulfilling. Artists maybe are fulfilled, but no one's happier. And I remember I was in my late 20s and I thought the problem with my job is everyone doesn't want my job. And I would go, for example, I have one vivid, vivid memory of going into the city in San Francisco and going to a very fancy cocktail party. And I was with my high school friend and she was a litigator. And, you know, the adults would come to the two young 28-year-olds and say, what are you gals up to? And she said, oh, I'm a litigator. And she got immediate praise, follow-up questions. It was so interesting and so amazing. And then the adult turned to me and said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a public school teacher. And they said, oh, good for you. And I thought, no, not good for me, good for this country. Like, I'm holding our democracy together. What did you do today? You know, like, and I felt, and I think, and now that I've interviewed hundreds of teachers all over the country, our society's mixed feelings about teachers, you know. And so I um, have been spending a lot of time, literally 10 years, trying to combat those uh, those sometimes sort of condescending uh, attitudes toward teaching, making sure that people know how valuable this profession is to our, to our country's well-being. And I used to only say, I used to only say, you know, this is really about our democracy. Like, we need to make sure that these young people are participating and that they understand how valuable our way of life is and that they feel connected to it um, and that they want to participate. And now I realize, too, it's, it's about our economy as well. We really need to make sure that students really do their very best work. And so we have to create conditions that allow teachers to do their best work as well. So for Teachers Have It Easy, I interviewed hundreds of teachers around the country, and everyone had stories about these mixed feelings. Uh, there was a woman named April Sharp from Florida. She told her parents she was going to teach. And they were like, honey, don't do that. Don't do that. Please don't teach. And then she was like, no, I, I, I really want to teach. And then she was Florida's Teacher of the Year. And they were like, you're the greatest. And so we just laughed because it's like the contrast even from the same people. Um, and we also documented, and Teachers Have It Easy, we documented not only how successful, excellent teachers were, but we also documented their financial sacrifices to teach, and we documented their second jobs. And um, in, then in 2011, we made a movie. I realized a lot of people would buy the book, and they would say, I gave it to my cousin, who's a, um, who's a teacher, and I thought, oh, well, she already knows all this story. I wrote, we wrote the book for you. Um, and so I, I decided in 2007 I never made a movie, or, you know, I... No, I, I know nothing about making movies, and I decided that I actually needed an easier tool, and I thought of Inconvenient Truth, and I thought, well, maybe if we have just an 80-minute experience, people will actually watch it, and then the point of the movie, of course, was to try and help people see that good teaching is really sophisticated work, and also that teachers shouldn't be making financial sacrifices to do this work. So um, one of the main characters in both the book and the movie is a friend of mine named Jonathan Dearman, and he was an electric teacher, and... Um, People called him the heartbeat of the school. He brought a whole music department to the school. There was a student that I interviewed, Lydia Bell, I interviewed her for the book years later, and she said that when she was at Gonzaga University that no professor was as hard as Dearman and that she would turn in a paper to one of her professors in college and think to herself, what would Dearman think? What would Dearman think? Like, is this good enough? Am I doing well enough for his standards? And um, I actually, in my hotel room earlier tonight, I watched a... I watched a short clip. I have 92 hours of film on my computer, and I watched a short clip of another young woman, Rachel Russell, who said that when her father died, that Dearman just called her and that she hadn't seen him for five years. And she, you'll meet her in a second in the trailer, that she just said, she's like, wherever I am in my life, I know that I can find him if I need him. Um, so he was one of those magnificent, magnetic, big personality big human being also, uh, and he decided to leave teaching because he was earning $42,000 in San Francisco, and he couldn't raise a family of two on $42,000, as you all know, living here. And so he made the heartbreaking decision to leave, and of course the community was undone. But this is only one example of people who leave, and so I'm going to play a two-minute trailer of the movie, and uh, you'll meet three other examples of people who make magnificent impacts on uh, American kids. I used to tell people that the government pays me to blow things up, and then they used to ask, are you in the NSA or the FBI or something like that? And I said, no, I teach science. 
they are our public servants, but why do I get the feeling that a lot of them are more in it for serving themselves? I know that I'm a teacher in every cell of my body. <laughs> we can achieve brilliance and we will achieve brilliance and it's going to be a lot of work, but it's, it's completely doable for everybody in this classroom. If they're here to serve our kids, why does it seem they're only serving us a big old bill. I had no idea how much money I was going to have to spend out of my own pocket because I didn't get anything, really. When I started telling my friends that I wanted to go into education, everyone immediately said, you went to Harvard. You should be a doctor or a lawyer. You should make money. Everyone's heard that old axiom that those who can do and those who can't teach. The proponents of that axiom have never stood in front of a classroom. Good morning, first grade. Good morning, Teachers make thousands of decisions a day, and they don't do it about an abstract idea. They do it about the life of a child. You can't imagine anything harder. Given the low pay and long hours, teachers burn out at a rate unparalleled in almost any other field. I feel like I give everything I have, but it's never enough. As the man, you're supposed to be the provider. When you can't provide for your family, you feel like a loser. We would like them to be getting to know their students and their parents, making sure that they're going to provide the great instruction that we've been talking about. Instead, they're off to 7-Eleven. Almost every teacher I know has a second job. Nobody would question a doctor being paid or a lawyer being paid. And I think the skill set required is at least as complex, if not more complex. In America, 46% of teachers quit before their fifth year. My son just graduated from college this year and he's making way more selling cell phones from Verizon than he ever could as a teacher. Something's wrong when selling cell phones is more important to our society than being a teacher. There are currently 3.2 million public school teachers in the United States. In the next 10 years, 1.8 million of them will be eligible for retirement. Who will replace them? Having a teacher that, that you can trust, you know, that will change lives. film and we took it around the country and uh, what we were hoping to do actually ultimately is improve teachers lives so the film like the books isn't very important we're just hoping for that impact so I'm going to share a little bit of the research that fuels what we're what we're all about and then um, and then we'll do our discussion and our homework and presence for educators but um, as Matt Damon said, a huge amount of teachers are about to retire. The movie was made a couple of years ago, so right now we still have a million teachers who are about to retire. So we have this incredible window to change what it means to be a teacher. And I've just always been incredibly offended that teachers are expected to take some sort of Mother Teresa vow of um, poverty. I really think it's a profession, and it should be paid accordingly. And unfortunately, as you'll see, uh, that's about the movie. Well, I'll... I'll get to that, and I'll get to what I was going to say in a second. But essentially, as, as it said, 32% of teachers have jobs outside of the classroom. So we met for, I have one San Franciscan here. Um, there's a head of the science department at Redwood High, which is a very fantastic school. The head of the science department pours wine at Plump Jack on the weekends. We met a kindergarten teacher who serves Tens Bar all weekend so that he can buy the supplies that he got tired of fighting his school for. Uh, I interviewed recently a North Carolina teacher named Karina Colon. She has something called a national, she's a nationally board certified teacher, which is a pretty intense credential. Out of the 3.2 million teachers, only 97,000 have that credential, and you work really, you strive for it. She was also teacher of the year in 2008, and then nominated again in 2013, 2012. And for the educators in the room, she says her favorite work is getting English language learners up to grade level. That is such complex work, it's staggering. And she in North Carolina found herself at a food bank with her three children and ultimately left North Carolina to work as an instructional coordinator in Maryland to earn $12,000 more. So it's not huge numbers that we need to change, but we do need to push, push, num we need to push them up. 92.4% um, of teachers use their own money to buy supplies. Teachers are priced out of home ownership in 32 metropolitan areas. In our country every year, 20% 20, 20 leave in the cities, and right now with the retirements, it's going to be more dramatic. Um, it's also true, there's interesting, this may be, this may be a hard thing to, to handle right now, but if you ask teachers, MetLife and the Gates Foundation did this research where they asked teachers what would help them be more effective, and salary was number 11th. 
And the reason is because once somebody goes into education, I didn't expect to ever make a ton of money. I was, I'm still a community worker. I still don't make any money. So I, was never, I, was never, I never thought I was on some big financial plan. So if you ask me what would help me do better at my job, it's not a higher salary. I want a great principal. I want collaboration time. I want all those other things. So teachers choose their, their conditions and their students before they choose themselves. But it's not, if you, you can't twist that and say, well, teachers don't care about money, because actually they do make financial decisions. Also, there's uh, socially acceptable research. So if you ask a group of teachers, if you all were a group of teachers, if I said, how much do you care about your salary? Less than 10% of you would say that you care. But if I asked you, do any of your colleagues care about their salary? Then 40% say, like somebody's talking about salary, but somebody else is doing it, not me. Because somehow, and I think it relates to also being women and advocating for ourselves. So I think there's sort of a storm of things that have allowed this terrible thing to happen, which is for the past 40 years, essentially teacher salaries have stayed the same. But average salary as percent of GDP has decreased at roughly 2% per year because everyone else has gone up and cost of living has gone up. So in the past 40 years, everything has changed. And hopefully you'll watch the movie that I made, but one of the things that Linda Darling-Hammond says is also before, teachers were, making, were doing better compared to other professionals, but women had less choices. And I'm not saying I'm thrilled that women can do whatever they want, but somehow we've given more prestige to these other jobs and the salaries haven't kept pace. Um, this is something that I love to share. In 1970, a starting teacher and a starting attorney were both earning around $45,000, both of their master's degrees. And now, a starting attorney in New York at a private firm, which would be the same for Boston, probably earns 160, and the poor teacher is still left at 45 with her master's degrees. I have devastating news. I didn't think I was going to say it because I thought there's a new dean of the Harvard Ed School. I got my credential at Harvard. I think Beth mentioned that. Um, the, I just went to an event in San Francisco and I said something about my master's program and they didn't know what I was talking about. They don't have a teacher training program anymore at Harvard. They're developing a new one now, but they canceled my program because we can't afford to pay for our master's. Did I say that too fast? My program literally doesn't exist because teachers aren't, aren't paid enough to make the $30,000 worth it. So for me, my parents gave me 10, Harvard gave me 10, and I borrowed 10 and that's how I pulled it off, and then I paid back that 10 over time. Um, but I had no college debt, so I was in a very unusual situation, and most people aren't as lucky. So I had a great experience, and it hurts my heart that, that other teachers won't have that opportunity. Anyway, have I depressed you? <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. This is, I think, this is, listen, there are places in the country where they're paying more, and we're seeing good changes, and obviously, is everyone a little bit tired of hearing about Finland? Is there a little tired of hearing about Finland? Okay, the reality is that successful countries just make sure that their teachers are paid on par with other professionals. We just can't have this major opportunity cost. Anyway, um, so what I think we should do with this information is I think, of course, we can pay professional salaries. Of course, we can make admissions selective. One more Finland anecdote. At one point, they, they stopped letting ed schools function. They canceled all education schools, and they only let their eight best universities train teachers. And that was one of the tipping points that changed everything. So we can't just have anyone going through ed schools everywhere. And they used to do what we do, which is we, we train way more humanities teachers than we need. And then it seems like, well, whatever, that teacher left, we'll just plop in another one. The successful countries don't have the turnover. They pay them professionally. We can do all these things. We can pay for teacher supplies. We can pay for teachers to get trained. Anyway. So what we're doing with this is we've initiated something. I'm going to give myself two more minutes, and then we'll do questions. Um, we kicked off something called the Governor's Challenge, and we're asking governors what they're going to do to honor the good teachers that are in their state and how they're going to attract the next batch. And uh, we sent a booklet filled with all kinds of rich uh, research-based facts, and we sent them each their uh, our movie, and then we sent them a personal letter, and uh, we also sent it to their spouses, all 43 of them, because we figure that those are hopefully their greatest influencers. So we sent a whole separate package to the spouse, and then we sent it to the state superintendent, or in your case, Commissioner Chester. Um, and we sent this booklet to everybody, and then we've developed a website where we're rating everybody based on your change. You in Massachusetts, you guys are the geniuses. I'm sure you know that if you were an isolated country, you wouldn't have to be embarrassed by the rest of the country's malaise, but your salaries the past 10 years have gone up 14.1%. 30 out of 50 states' salaries have gone down over the past 10 years. 
So we're just, we're, we're heading sort of completely in the wrong direction. And you might say, why governors? Governors have incredible power to set the agenda for their state. A lot, this is, and this is another thing that I'm learning. I talked to, in Arkansas, I talked to Mike Beebe's education senior policy analyst, a woman probably my age. Um, and I said, well, look, uh, Mike Beebe's a Democrat. And, um, and she said, well, I want you to look at his education record. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's an odd legacy. He's finishing his second term and he's leaving, he's leaving uh, Arkansas. And I said, well, it's an odd legacy, don't you think? During the course of his tenure, salaries have gone down. And the excuse that she gave me, which is what I'm getting from California, Maryland, a bunch of different places, is like, well, it's locally controlled funding. And I said, but don't you think that that's really interesting? Because right now, he just presented last week, this is Mike Beebe, Arkansas, he presented a balanced budget to his leadership on Monday, and it had a 2% increase for education. So he's giving himself a pat on the back, and he's telling everybody, I'm an education person. All the research shows, all of it now, that in a school, the most important component is the teacher. So I think it's ironic and silly to continue to just hand over money without explicitly saying to the communities, listen, I believe in locally controlled funding, but don't forget, it's the people, it's the people, it's the people. Look at what we're doing. I want my state to be a place where people will come to instead of repelling teachers away. So that's a pattern that we're seeing. But meanwhile, we're highlighting governors who are, this is Hawaii, he, um, his uh, salaries were going down. The governor of Hawaii is especially struggling because of the rural areas, and so he is gathering a commission to study this. So we're asking the governors to do anything but to use their podium to say something about salary. So since we've started, we have a couple other successes. Governor Haley, we have to quote, we have to change our tone in education, support our teachers in a way we never have. Governor McCrory, that everybody hates him. He's North Carolina, so we can hate him. But he did say, right now the increase in teacher pay is happening so slowly. Many of them may be leaving after the first several years when we're losing potential good uh, career teachers for life, Fox News. Governor Haslam, uh, quote, I'm committed to having Tennessee be the fastest improving state in the nation when it comes to teacher salaries. Governor Martinez, she's raising salaries in New Mexico, the base pay from 30 to 33 I'd like that 33 number to be higher, but the reality is even with that, with that amount of difference, she will see a difference in who applies and who comes to her state. So she's doing the right thing. And then Governor Scott in Florida, uh, quote, I can think of no better investment for our state than investing in those teachers who work on the front line of Florida's future. So what we're trying to do is create a storm. And when we don't get responses from the governor's office, we're going to use shame, humiliation, and votes to get rid of those people. Um, so this is an example of where we're going. Uh, and I would love your feedback. You can tell me how I can improve this campaign. We're still waiting to hear from Governor Rick Perry about his plans for the teaching profession in the state of Texas. Change in average public school teacher salaries over the past decade has been negative 3.4%. Spending per pupil in Texas is $8,671 annually, while Texas spends $21,390 per prison inmate. Thank you, Governor Perry. Um, so I'm going to say four things, give you your homework. One is uh, the important thing to know, and people misinterpret what I'm saying, and I just said a whole bunch of stuff really quickly, is that a whole bunch of money isn't going to turn some horrible teacher into a great teacher. That's not what's going to happen. And great teachers don't need money to motivate them. So what I'm hoping for is a, is a sort of dramatic shift in how much we value the profession so that it doesn't chop people out before they start. And I'm really deeply offended, and I hope you guys are too, that teachers continue, if they continue to have second jobs and struggle financially and not be able to live close to where they work. Um, so I just, I just want to get out of this charity work mode. So the second thing that I want to say is that I don't think that raising salaries is the only thing that healthy schools need to do. There's a whole list of things, and I spent uh, last night with my old boss, and we talked about a lot of things that we want to see happen. And so I'm aware of those things. But I don't believe that until we get the people part right and stabilize the people, then the rest of it matters. And um, third, I know people think that I'm completely out to lunch or totally naive that we should change this in our country. But I just want to point out that we've had other major shifts. We don't. We try to save water and we don't change our sheets in hotels. We don't smoke in public. We have handicap accessibility. I've looked into the handicap accessibility movement and there was so much resistance and people said no way it's too expensive we're not going to do that what every building handicap accessible and what we did as Americans is it was expensive and it was the right thing to do so we did it anyway 
And so those things motivate me because I think, wow, my kids, I mean, I use a seatbelt. When I was growing up, I mean, I'm 42, but the seatbelt was my mom's arm thrown against my chest. And so I feel like these are cool for the right reasons, big changes that we've made. And I'm just suggesting that this is the next cool for the right reasons, big change that we should make. And um, finally, I, I think there's only half of you who are educators. I think as Americans, we really have to embrace the idea that other people's, other people's children doing well is in our best interest. And, and we, I think we don't know it as, as deeply as we really need to start to really understand that. So here's your homework slide. Um, the first assignment is to join 826 Boston's family as a volunteer, shopper, or donor. You can go to 826boston.org. And Daniel very sweetly brought a little mini store here so you can start your shopping extravaganza tonight. Um, you can join our movement at theteachersalaryproject.org. When you sign our pledge online, an email goes directly to the governor's office. And we really need a million people on the pledge because when I call them, I need to say, I have a million people who signed, so I need your help. And then um, you can follow us on Twitter and all that stuff. I need all of that. I'm not good at any of that. Again, I'm 42. I didn't grow up with any of that stuff. So if you can help me with that, that would be great. And then I just hope that everyone votes for those who understand that our country's well-being is completely intertwined with our children's well-being. And um, with that, I just want you to join me and imagine a day when college students stay up at night and are as worried about possibly becoming a teacher the same way that they worry about getting into medical school. So thanks, you guys, for coming. That's it.